after, at some point, Cyborg walked in and he looked at me, he was like, Ben, now you have a choice. You choose to be real. You, ch you, you, ch you, can, you can choose to sit here and feel bad for yourself or you can show the world that you're, how strong you are, that everything's gonna be okay. And I mean, at that point, bro, like he kind of made the choice for me. Like, I wasn't gonna be a little bitch. That's not who I am, you know? I wasn't gonna sit there and like, oh no, my life sucks. Like, of course, like, I went through that, bro. Like, but, but at that point, I made a choice that I was, I was gonna rise above it. Hello, friends. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the Main Idea Podcast, where today I have the pleasure of sitting down with Ben Kunzel. If you love this podcast and want to support it, please take 30 seconds and leave a five-star review on Apple or Spotify and subscribe to the YouTube channel. This helps the show get discovered organically and helps me to continually bring on amazing guests. There are also now timestamps in the show notes, so feel free to jump around to the part that interests you most, although I always recommend listening to the episode in its entirety. Ben Kunzel is a jiu-jitsu black belt under Roberto Cyborg Abro, motivational speaker and athlete for the South Florida Rattlers wheelchair rugby team. Ben suffered a C5, C6 spinal cord injury during training that left him paralyzed from the biceps down. Despite his injury, Ben continues to push his limits, train diligently, and strengthen his already fortified mindset. I hope that you enjoy this episode as much as I did. Without further ado, Ben Kunzel. So Ben, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. I know I was probably bothering you a lot in the direct messages, but I really wanted to get you on here. I find your story and just your attitude extremely inspirational. So I appreciate you carving out the time to be here, man. Oh, yeah, of course, bro. Thank you for having me. It's I'm, I'm excited. So maybe we can just walk it back um, to the incident, and then we'll really expand into jujitsu, your mindset, philosophy, strength training, all these kind of things, these elements of your life. But can you take me back to the day uh, when the incident happened and, and what you were preparing for? Uh, yeah, man. It was a typical Monday morning. It was one week away from the IBJJF Brown Belt World Championship. Um, I was waking, I woke up, I went to go train. It was actually supposed to be my last hard training session. After that, I was just gonna drill. And I did the full like pro training, uh, fight sports, it was a normal training. And then I was literally almost done, bro. And I was like, let me get one last tough round in. And I look around the room and I see my friend Alexander and I'm like, bro, let's go. And he's like, all right, let's go. So we high five. He tries to go for a takedown on me. And I like, he tried to go for a single leg. And I kicked my leg out and tried to shoot him for a fireman carry. But in the process of doing that, my foot slipped on the wet mat. And he actually landed right here in the process because it was just a bad, bad shot with the slip and everything. Like he sprawled? Uh, yeah, he kind of like went spinning around, like to yeah. spin around. And then uh, since I slipped, I had bad posture. And so his body kind of came crashing down right here. And right away, I felt the <laughs> on my neck. And I instantly screamed. I was like, ah! And right away, I mean, his intention wasn't to hurt me. You know, he was trying to defend the takedown. So right, right away, he jumped off me. And I, I tried to get up, and I couldn't. I tried to move my body, and I, nothing, nothing worked. And uh, they were like, all right, like, can you feel me moving your leg? And, and they, moved, they tried to move my leg, and I didn't feel anything. And so right away, um, they kind of like moved everybody away from me. They stopped the training for a little bit, but then they kept the training going. They like put everybody on the other side of the mat. And um, they called the paramedics. Paramedics rushed over. They cut my gi off of me. They put me on those little tray things that they carry people. And um, I was rushed to the hospital. The hospital ride was bad because the moment it happened, um, of course, it felt like something was wrong. But, you know, you had the adrenaline, you're fighting. It didn't really hurt. Totally. Like, I didn't feel pain the moment that it happened. But in the ambulance ride, once I started cooling down, I felt the pain, man. And every time that, like, the ambulance would turn or there would be a bump, um, what ended up happening was there was, like, a, a C5, C6. The, so the spinal cord is, like, a bunch of... Yep. The spine is a bunch of, co of, like, columns and bones, right? They're all stacked together, and the spinal cord was in the middle. What happened was they dislocated. And so every bump that went, like, the bone was just jamming more into the spinal cord. 
And by the time I went, I got to the hospital, bro, I was in excruciating pain, man. It was it was really rough, but are they like? Uh, are you are you hooked up to to IVs? Or are they giving you like pain medication or anything like that in the ambulance, or is this kind of just like a n- no no a standard Actually, ride? Standard ride. Actually, I remembered I was in the I was in the ambulance, and my mom lives in Paraguay. She lives overseas. That's where I'm originally from. And I remember I told the paramedic I was like, hey, like, can you get my phone and call my mom and tell her you guys take me to the hospital. Um, and it was a pretty crazy experience, man. But by the time I got to the hospital, they were like asking me all these questions, trying to do like a survey on me. I was like, bro, just give me the painkiller to make this stop and do the surgery with me, you know? I don't care anymore. And then um, they put me to sleep. I woke up and that was it. I was I was in the hospital bed already with the neck brace on. So did they perform uh, emergency surgery or what was the, the protocol there? Like when, when you went under, they obviously give you anesthesia and um, usually they do that for a surgery. So what happened? What surgery did they do? They did a C5, C6 uh, fusion. So what they did is they, they, they decompressed, they put everything back in and I have a rod and two screws here on my spine to uh like bracket it in place essentially exactly oh. and so that what that does is it, it puts the the spine back in place and thus taking the pressure off the spinal cord right oh my god what was man i i mean thank you for sharing all this stuff there's there a lot of questions but like in those initial moments when you come to what what was like the gravity of the situation i mean are you you have a high pain tolerance, right? You're a brown belt in jiu-jitsu. You've been training for years. You can go hard all the time. You still do. You know, we'll talk about that later. And so your mindset is fortified. You're a strong individual physically and mentally. When you wake up from that surgery, what were those initial thoughts? Was your family there? Were your friends around you? Like, what were those the first so you know, the day per- after surgery? The first person that I saw was actually, um, it was... One of the black belts of fight sports, his name is uh, Kodiak Fields. I don't know if you've mm-hmm. heard of him. He's a master's guy, a really tough guy. Yeah. I think he's a multiple-time world champion. Um, anyway, wow. um, I opened my eyes, and he's like, what's up, bro? Like, smiling, all happy, you know, and just great vibes. And, um, you know, it was pretty cool, bro, because when I got hurt, I wasn't alone, ever, bro. Like, office visiting hours were from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., and I literally had people rotating. There was like, they, they only allowed, I was in the ICU for the first week, right? Yeah. So they only allowed um, like two people at a time. And man, there was lines of like my friends, my students, my training partners, you know, people that I worked with that, um, that were just circling in and out the whole time. So it was, it was a little bit interesting because I didn't really have time to fully process it, you know? Yeah, and I I don't know if it was the first day or the second day, but after at some point, Cyborg walked in to the room. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cyborg's my professor, and and he looked at me. He was like, "Ben, right now you have a choice. Who do you choose to be, bro? You ch- you you ch- you can you can choose to sit here and feel bad for yourself, or mm-hmm. you can show the world that you how strong you are and that everything's gonna be okay." And I mean, at that point, bro, like he kind of made the choice for me. Like I wasn't gonna be a little bitch. Yeah. That's not who I am, yeah. you know? I wasn't going to sit there and, like, <laughs> like, oh, no, my life sucks. Like, of course, like, yeah. I went through that, bro. Like, I went through the process, you know? Mm-hmm. But but at that point, I made a choice that I was I was going to rise above it. It's incredible, man, to, to see a community form around that. <clears throat> you know, like you said, people stacked up outside just to see you. That's something really special that, uh, I mean, I, I obviously talk about jujitsu a lot. It's a big theme in this show, and there's a level of camaraderie that exists within academies that is really cool. It is, yeah. it kind of transcends different barriers. Like there's people that, you know, you train with four or five days a week that maybe you don't hang out with on the weekend, but they would show up for you in those kind of situations. So it's these, these very powerful connections. How, what led you though? Like that's incredible that cyborg came in and delivers this message, but to be fair, you have to be someone who's receptive to that kind of thing also because the same person could come in and deliver that message to someone else and they might just not receive it or or not be able to put it into action so when you think back on on your childhood on your life what do you think prepared you to be the type of person that can take that advice and actually put it in motion 
Um, truth is, bro, like, I, I come from a good family, you know, like, I, I come from a good family, and I, uh, financially, like, of course, we had times where we were struggling, but we were always good, um, but what really shifted me and forced me to completely reinvent my, myself, my perspective, who I am, was my parents got divorced. Yeah. I was already training jiu-jitsu. I was 16 years old, and I was living not not too far, like an hour away from where I live now. But it was a suburb, and now I live in the city, right? And so when I was 16 years old, um, you know, your family is like your identity. It's like you're, you're, the family is the foundation for who you are. They shape you. They, yeah. A lot of the times, the thoughts that you have, they aren't yours. They're thoughts that you picked up along the way because of, you know, thoughts that you heard at home or at school or whatever. But um, so when I had to reinvent myself there, I actually went through like, a really tough depression. Believe it or not, bro, it was harder to deal with my parents' divorce than it was to deal with the paralysis. Why is that? I think it was because uh, the parents' divorce to me was like so rough, so so shift. It was like the first time that I had to reinvent myself. Does that make sense? Yeah. And yeah. so now it was like, okay, I just have to do it again. But the difference was that throughout the divorce, whenever I had a difficult time, I would just turn to jujitsu. And like, yeah, I was an outlet jiu-jitsu as an outlet, yeah. but this time I, I almost didn't have an outlet for the longest time, you know, that's so crazy. My, uh, my parents divorced when I was 16 too. Yeah. And when it happened, like, I, I, to be honest, I could similarly come from a wonderful family. I love my parents, uh, at, at this point have good relationships with both of them. And at that time that that happened, it was really confusing because I was 16. I wasn't a nine year old. You know, I was a, I wasn't an adult yet, but I was almost an adult. And it was so much more shattering than I thought it was at the moment. And it didn't hit me until like 18, 19, 20. Like that's when I actually think I really digested it. And then it shaped, it changed my worldview about family and the value of family and what, what that means and how important it is. And it was a, a much harder thing to go through than I thought at the time. I just thought like, oh, well, now I got two houses and, uh, you know, I can go here for with my mom and I can go there with my dad and everything's cool. Uh, but the reality of what's happening, that shattering or like rupturing of that family unit, it is really intense from it, for anybody, you know, 100%. how did you get how did you get through that? Um. Honestly, bro, I was kind of numb for like a year. So what happened was I, I, I started training when I was 11 years old in Weston. And I remember when I was like 15 and a half, they, they originally split up. And I found out one day at like 11 p.m. My dad had been gone for like three days. And my mom was like, yo, he's not coming back. And um, I remember right away, I called my friend who had Matt in his garage. And I was like, yo, get the boys together. We got to train. I had an emergency. We have to train. And bro, me and like my four friends got together and we straight to 1 a.m. Like just beating the crap out of each other. Yeah. And and I and I went home, bro, and everything was fine. I was like, okay, it's okay. Like I got all that anger out. Um, yeah. And and so then like, what happened was we moved to Miami, me and all my siblings and my mom. And my mom couldn't make ends meet. So she was here for like, couple months and then she had to go back home and she took all my siblings with her but the issue was in paraguay like i was one of the best to just pre i was one of, i was one of the best guys already you know like i and there wasn't going to be that much room for growth in terms of uh, my progress. if you went back and my focus was to be the best athlete in the world so i was like all right i'm gonna you go mom i'm gonna stay here and i stayed until the lease ended living off of like a hundred bucks for like a month. I ate like eggs and I ate like eggs and, and bread just so that I could train. And then when the lease ended, I called my dad, um, who was living, um, with his new girl at the time. And they're still actually, they're married now. And, um, and I was like, dad, like I, I need a place to stay. And so my dad took me in and, um, and, and that was kind of like the process of how I coped with the divorce and my transition to, to stay here in the U S and keep training full time. So I, I have a question about the fights. Fight sports is obviously a, a juggernaut of an academy, right? Some some of the best grapplers in the world train there, both in mixed martial arts and isolated in jujitsu as well. And it it's truly like a powerhouse of production. Uh, when I was younger and when my parents divorced, I was a competitive skier for years in Colorado. 
And my team became a really important part. Again, I didn't think about this much at the time, but looking back on it, it became this very important family unit where going and, and talking with my coaches, having that like tough love from them, uh, interacting with my teammates, it, it kind of functioned as this like unit in space where my home unit was like split in half. So when you are, maybe you can talk about how you got to fight sports. And I'm curious, did people like Cyborg and the other, you know, professors there and, and veterans there, did they play any kind of role like that for you in guidance and like family? Oh yeah, bro. hundred percent. So when I moved to Miami, I, I tried like all the, I lived, I was living in like the downtown area yeah. and um, I went to all the local gyms. I went to Haley and Gracie, the Coral Belt, amazing guy. Um, I went to a couple different gyms and everywhere I went, I was like pretty good, you know? And I remember I went to fight sports and I got beat up really bad. <laughs> <I got some laughs> That's how you know. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, all right, like clearly there's something different here. Clearly like yeah. these guys are, this is, this is what, this is what I need to surround myself with. And that's kind of how I ended up choosing there. And um, yeah, man, there's actually, there's one guy in particular who like stood out. Uh, of course, Master Dennis, Cyborg, um, later on, Victor Doria came along and helped a lot too. Wagner played a huge role yeah. in, the, in the last few years that I was there. Um, but in the beginning, there was a black belt. He actually went back and he opened up a social project in Brazil. His name is Glau, Glaudiston, but we call him Glau. And um, bro did not speak a lick of English, but he saw that I was dedicated and he saw that I would show up before class and I tried to work out and, and I would always find somebody to drill with. So he pretty much like with a huge language barrier, he kind of broke, like broke, somehow broke that barrier through jujitsu and, and he would just like show me what to do. And we would drill for like two hours before class. And then I would, he would give me a workout routine. I would do a workout routine and then I would do the beginner's class and he would teach the advanced class and I would do that. And he became a big role model for me, man, you know, and, and, uh, in the process of going through the divorce, that was, he was definitely like, uh, the big brother figure that I needed since my big brother left when he went, when they all went back to Paraguay, you know? It, yeah. It's special. The, the relationship between a coach and an athlete can be really powerful. They can, they can provide a type of insight that like you don't necessarily get from a parent because your parents are so close to you you know they're your blood yeah. you get that that coach can kind of be like really straightforward with you tell you exactly what you need to hear and sometimes it's not what you want to hear but it is what you need to hear and it helps you kind of push through i had i had you know coaches tell me things in in difficult moments that really i think were kind of like pivotal in my ability to go beyond that it's it's incredible are you able to you know, at, at this point, or, or maybe even prior to the injury too, were you in a position where you were kind of starting to give back and help uh, younger athletes, up and comers, people that you saw kind of the same kind of personality traits that you have in yourself? Oh, yeah, man. I, um, there's, there's, these, there's a couple, like, I used to coach kids, but I didn't like coaching the kids' class because some kids, bro, they're not there to learn. They're there because their parents no. want to go. Yeah, so I used to, like, I used to love teaching kids privates. Because then, then you you really get to work with the kids who actually want to get better, um, and I mean yeah man I have I have these two little girls that I I made them into like kids pan champs, love it yeah and um, Lily and Lucy, and actually bro believe it or not and listen to this I broke my yeah. neck at like ten thirty a.m. on a Monday mm -hmm. May twenty third, bro at four p.m. I was gonna go sign the paper to, to open up my own gym. No way. On God, bro. I was going to go send the lease. Wow. Um, but I guess it wasn't time yet. You know what I mean? Yeah. How, so how did the... <coughs> you're in there. You're training. You're getting ready for a huge tournament. You're a highly skilled practitioner. You, Like you said, you kind of outgrew an entire country that you were from. <laughs> and you're you're in the mecca of, of fight sports and, and getting better. This event happens. You're in the hospital... When you found out the severity of what happened, what did that do to like your perceived trajectory, life path, um, your interests? How did all that change? Um, well, truth is, bro, like when the doctors originally told me that I would never walk again, I was like, bro, you don't know who you're talking to. Yeah. 
they were like, you never go. I was like, bro, like, like you don't understand. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a top two athlete. Like you don't, you don't, like you're wrong. Um, and then, cause you know in jujitsu you're used to getting hurt, bro. You're always like, you're you're always hurt in jujitsu. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you know you get hurt. Like yeah. the month goes by and you're better. And that's I thought this was gonna be the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> but then um like three weeks went by, and I remember I had just gotten into my power chair. The power chair is like. Yeah. The Stephen Hawking chair, you know. Yep. <laughs> and um. What the joy say? <laughs> and it was it was the first time that I went outside to see a sunset, and I was with my mom, and I'm at, I'm outside the hospital watching the sunset. And I remember I, I just broke down and I started crying. Yeah. And uh, I look at mom and I was like, Mom, I peaked at twenty three. Oh. Everything, everything. Oh, obviously, I look. I look back now yeah, and I'm yeah, so yeah, glad yeah, that I was yeah. gone, right? Right, right. And I was like, Mom, I peaked at twenty three. Like my whole life, I I did it, and and for what? Like, what what, yeah. what was was it worth it? Like, no, I thought to myself. But little did I know, bro, that it was just the beginning of a new life. And honestly, I can tell you, uh, in the terms of like mental health, I'm way better off now than I was before the injury, which is honestly mind blowing to me. It's mind blowing to me too. Maybe you can <clears throat> elaborate on that a little bit because I, I think from anyone on the outside of what your experience was, it feels it seems life ending, right? Like it feels seems so immense. Especially you're not um, a sedentary guy who sits on the couch all week and watches TV. You're an extremely active athlete who's also trying to be the the absolute best. Again, it's not like you're just you do your things, you do your 10,000 steps a day. I mean, you are trying to be the absolute best. And that's a very specific type of psychology. It's a very specific type, type of person. So how can that be? How can you be? And I mean this more, not like disbelief, but more yeah. curiosity about the, of the mindset. How can you be happier now and more content and in better headspace than before something so life altering? Well, I think I was more insecure before. I think I, I, I have I have proven to myself what I'm capable of, and I mean society has proven how much value I've added and and all the support that I've given to people because of the support that I got when I got hurt. Right. Right. And so I think my life experiences have just kind of brought me to a point where I see what I'm capable of, and 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 bro, I've literally gone through what I think is some of the hardest things that some, I want to say it's the hardest, but it's one of the hardest things that somebody can go through. And if I can come go through that and, and come out prosperous, then bro, good luck stopping me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it's incredible. Like <coughs> I'm sure you hear this all the time. So it, I'm going to be a broken record. But, <coughs> I mean, it, it's truly inspirational watching not only the stuff that you put out and, and, you know, like you show your, your training sessions and your workouts and stuff, but it's your enthusiasm and your mindset around it. It's very genuine. It is not, um, or unless I'm completely wrong, but I tend to be a good judge of character. Yeah. It's not false. It's not fake. It's not, uh, just garnering engagement. I mean, your messages and the things you say, they feel really real. They feel truly inspirational. And like, I know that there's people out there who don't know you, who come in contact with the stuff that you put out. And I guarantee that you're having a positive impact on their life, which makes you an extremely rare person on social media because you're actually doing something that has a net positive for good. You're impacting people's lives. How many other kids out there, you know, without a, a following or engagement, no outlet who maybe didn't find jujitsu and they're in the same position. And now they have, they see this guy kicking ass and doing pull-ups and, you know, playing sports and, and doing stuff and saying, yeah, this happened to me, but it doesn't define me. And that's it's fucking beautiful, dude. I mean, it, it's it's so awesome. Do you get to get in contact with these people and hear their feedback and their outreach? Like, what is that like? Yeah, man, honestly, it's it's great. I like uh, when you said that the first thing that came to my mind is um, I had a, I had a guy message me um, a couple months ago and he was like, bro. I have brain cancer. I had pretty much given up on my life. But your content, just seeing your content, like it's inspired me to keep going back to rehab and keep fighting through the chemo and making it work. And I, mean, I don't know where he's at in life right now, but bro, I hope he's killing it because, or you know, like 
what a good feeling it is to know that I, I inspired someone who had almost given up on life to keep pushing forward. Um, I even actually, I opened up a nonprofit with my sister. Um, no way. Yeah, it's called Push On. We're the Push On Foundation. We're still in the early stages, but we are officially like tax stamped and an official nonprofit. And, um, and the whole idea is to help people with spinal cord injuries um, get back into sports because I know that throughout my whole life, like we spoke about before, like sports has always been an outlet for me. And I know how it's forced me into having this like quote unquote champion mentality, right? Yeah. And so my whole idea is like people, once you've been paralyzed, bro, it's so hard to come back. It's, it's your body's literally doing its best to not do anything. And you have to right. force it to be like, you have to force yourself to be uncomfortable 24 seven. And so um, the whole point of the nonprofit is pretty much just to help people transition back into an active lifestyle after a spinal cord injury. Well, well, 100%. Um, and remind me at the end, because we'll do this. We'll put a link to the nonprofit in the show notes so people can access that. They can see what you're about. They can donate if they want. Awesome. Um, so we'll make sure to put that in there. Can you can you talk to me a little bit about this this exact transition? So between lying in the hospital bed post-surgery and where you are today, what was it like to get back into a strength and conditioning routine, a, a fitness routine? What did working out feel like on like a internal level? I mean, what, what was that process like for you? Well, I mean, at first, bro, forget working out, dude. I, I couldn't even sit up. I mean, wow. at, at first. And, and I, I don't mean sit up, like hold myself up. I mean, like, like with a backrest, like if you incline my bed and I went forward, my blood yeah. pressure would drop and I would almost faint. Jesus. Yeah, and and actually, you know, funny story, bro. I, I was in the hospital when I first got hurt. I was I was a little congested, bro, and my lungs weren't really working because the, they're below the level of injury. And so, yeah. like at night, bro, I had a I had a vacuum in my throat at all times, and it was sucking the mucus out of my throat. Honestly, dude, at first it was really rough, man. It, it just 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 surviving was like a battle within itself, you know. But yeah. uh, definitely made me stronger. And once I was able to overcome that, like, then I had to start, like, I started raising my arms a little bit. I couldn't raise my, I couldn't move my arms at first, right? So, like, I would just try to lift my arm all day, all day, all day. And then eventually the right arm started moving and then the left arm started moving a little bit after. Right. <laughs> and then I started uh, doing, like, some band work. Yep. And then um, they introduced me to, like, wheelchair rugby and I started playing wheelchair rugby and I actually had a very good friend of mine he was he was actually my student I used to teach him private lessons and he owns a boxing gym here in South Beach and um and he would come to the hospital one day he came to visit me and he was sitting through one of my therapies and bro therapy was so boring uh physical therapy yeah yeah because they just yeah. move your body for you pretty much like right I couldn't really you're, you're just trying to get back online like the nerve function and everything. So they're, if they're like, hold your hand and they're like, squeeze and you go. And then yeah. the next time they're like, squeeze. And it's like that kind of stuff, right? Exactly, exactly. And so like the whole thing was just making it fun. Like my Dino came over and, and he would like hold pool noodles and I would like try to just touch the pool noodles, you know? And like, yeah. that was like, that was like the therapy within itself. And then we started like playing with boxing and eventually I would like bob and bob and hit him back and, and it was, it was just, it's a whole process, man. Lately, these last few weeks, this last month or so, really, I, I, I started bodybuilding. And bro, I see, I've watched every second of it. <laughs> yeah, man. It's and the, rad. The, 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 the rate at which my body's recovering through the bodybuilding is just mind-blowing. Like, I had no idea. Because I had been working out, but not like, not like this, you know? I had yeah. been doing therapy, but therapy is one thing, bro. Training like an athlete is something else. You know what I mean? It's different. So with um, <clears throat> with the strength training, uh, I'm just curious, like, how do you manage hope or, or like, what is your relationship with hope? Because I feel like in situations like these, you, you want maybe on, on some deep level to like be back to where you were and these injuries are severe, right? But at the same time, you're making insane progress. I mean, dude, you're, you've gone from not moving, not not being able to support your body sitting up, if we're talking about like core strength, internal function, all this kind of stuff, to being able to do that, to boxing, to bodybuilding, to 
gaining mass. I mean, like you're just trucking along on this line of possibility. You're everything that you can manage to do. You're finding a way to get it done. Yeah. So I can only imagine as like someone who, who also <laughs> shares this enjoyment of pushing the limits and challenging themselves. How do you deal with hope? Like, do you hope that one day, you know, it just keeps going down the line like that and then leg like, function comes back? Like, how do you how do you think about that? How do you manage your relationship with that emotion? Well, at first I had a lot of hope, but I found that I kept getting disappointed. And so I shifted to the new uh, concept, which is instead of being result driven, I'm effort driven. Right. Love that. Yeah. And so the whole idea is. All right, man, I can't, I can't control the outcome, but I can control how hard I work. I can control how much work I put in. And whatever happens, happens, bro. You know, whatever happens, happens. And I'm just going to put my head down and do my best and enjoy the process. At the end of the day, that's what it's all about, right? Dude, absolutely. I was actually just thinking about this uh, at our academy the other day because you'll be training with someone. And I'm sure you, you definitely know this feeling because you, you're training at a high level. You feel someone quit. Like there's this sensation that happens, right? You, whether it's you start to hear their breathing or you feel the tension just go in their Like whatever it is, there's a moment where someone gives up in a, a role. And when you feel that, it's really empowering. Like it's almost like you get an energy drink. And because you know you've you've gone beyond the physical and you tapped into their will and you you broke their will. And when you're when you're doing things like this, your will must just be like solid brick. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> I used to call that moment that you're talking about when I used to tell my students, I used to call it that oh shit moment. <laughs> like, you know, you know, like, uh, like when the guy passes your guard, like you can be like, oh shit, he passed my guard. Yep. Or, or you can be like, oh shit, he passed my guard. Frame, bring that leg in, yep. you know? Um, But but to circle back that's to your well, question, bro, like you, well, just, you can't you can't break what can't be broken, bro. Like, yeah, you know, if I, I'm I'm not gonna give up. It's not a choice, bro. Like, I, I mean, I'm used to getting smashed by by Roosevelt and Cyborg and having and having Victor <laughs> Vega put his head under my chin and try to smash him, open me up so he can pass my guard. You know, like if I can fight through that, bro, I can, I can fight through just about anything. So, what's your uh? What's your like your workout split like? What are you? What's a typical week for you in terms of training? Now that you're on this like bodybuilding regiment, and how do you train with your training partners? Um. So, um. Uh, so pretty much it's like this. I do Monday push. Yep. Tuesday pull, mostly upper body, right? And then I, I try to stand up every day, and whenever I can, get to the hospital and do like the electronic stem leg bike. I can. Mm -hmm. Um. But the stem bike is not the priority. So what I do is I do Monday push, full upper body yeah. push. Uh, Tuesday, full upper body pull. Wednesday, I'll try to hit shoulders. Thursday, this morning, I did three miles in my rugby chair. Yeah. Then... So that's like uh, you're, you're powering the wheels as you go, right? And then it, yeah. it, But it's not stationary. You use like a no, track or yeah, use yeah, a field? I, exactly. I went to the track and I, I yeah. just busted out three miles. Um, next week, I'll, I'll do more. Uh, I'm 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 slowly progressing. Today was my first day actually um, getting back to doing that. But that's and, like I mean, when you're pushing the the rugby chair, that there's resistance within the wheel set, right? So it's not like that's not an easy thing to do. I mean, you you are pushing against some degree of resistance, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the rugby chair is designed. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen wheelchair rugby, but we like crash into each other. We yeah, like, it has like the um the angular wheels, <laughs> right, with the block on it, so yeah. you can like come up and basically hit your opponents but it won't tip you over well i've seen a couple of my friends fall i haven't fallen off <laughs> yeah <laughs> if you hit each other hard enough somebody falls <laughs> there you go Con um, full contact yeah uh, anyways no yeah yeah it's, it, there is there is resistance especially if you're going like uphill or like against wind you know and so uh today i did that tomorrow i'm gonna work out again saturday i'm gonna rest and sunday i have rugby practice nice How, so how cool is that? I mean, what, what's talking about camaraderie again, like we did in the beginning about like the academy. What is the camaraderie amongst your teammates in that setting? Bro, it was really cool, man. When I, when I first pulled up to rugby, I was still in my power chair. Um, yep. And I get there and all these guys start roasting me. They're all quadriplegics. 
<laughs> and they're like, oh, look at this fresh quad in this power chair. You know, yeah. like, what are you, what are you doing, man? You look ridiculous. You got you got you got to switch into a manual chair. Yeah. And then like at first, just moving from one chair to another, it's so hard, bro. Because like you have to carry your yeah. whole weight with your arms. And so at first, I would have like people pick me up and put me in the chair. And then they started roasting me like, ah, oh, bro, you can't even get in your own chair by yourself. Oh, what's up with that, man? Oh, you, if you, no team's ever going to want to take you if you can't even get in your own chair. And so then, fuck, okay, now I got to work on getting into my own chair. Yeah. And then uh, one day after practice, we all went out to eat. <coughs> and um, we all went out to eat. And, and I used to have, like, these special utensils. Yeah. Just make eating so much easier. And so we're all, they bring us the food and I take out my special utensils because the hands, you know, they're limited function. Yep. And this guy's like, ah, what the fuck, bro? You're using the special utensils, little bitch, whatever. And fuck, okay, now I have to once again learn, relearn yeah. how to use normal utensils that you have in a restaurant. And so they just, it's awesome, bro, because they just, they push you to get better, you know? Now yeah. we're going to be traveling in December. We're going to go to our first tournament in Ohio. And it's going to yeah. be, I, the other day I went to test it out and I, I stayed in a hotel by myself overnight. Mm-hmm. I went to visit some friends uh, across the state, but I'm excited because this is going to be more than just one night. We're going to be there for like three, four nights and it's going to be me and my wheelchair buddies and nobody really there to help us. And I'm pretty excited, man. You know, it's just constant growth. That's incredible. I I mean, I think that there's, there's some value in like shit talking, I think, you know, as long as if underneath it's good hearted, right? They want you to be better. That's why they're saying that. They're exactly. not saying that to put you down. They want, and, and they all got it when they joined the first day, right? Someone right. else was roasting them. But look on the other side of it. You're gaining function, you're gaining ability. You're teaching yourself to do things that if you weren't in that environment, you might never be motivated to even pick up in the first place. It's just like jujitsu. You go in there and you know, someone roasts you. And so you're like, oh, man, I got to like, I need to level up my ability. I need to, to do more. I need to do that. I need to get better. And so it's at the end of the day, those same people would give you a hug. You know, they're, they're not doing it because they want you to feel like shit. They're doing it because they want to push you and it creates growth, which is incredible. <clears throat> and some people can handle it and some people can't, right? Like that's, you'll see it a lot. I, th- I really think that that's why blue belts don't last in jiu-jitsu because, bro, blue belts are the easiest target to roast. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody loves making fun of the blue belts. But you yep. make fun of them because, like, you want them to be better. And so it's just, like, a friendly bullying thing. And some people can handle it and some people can't. Yeah, dude, it's crazy. So I've I've been doing jiu-jitsu, I think, like, five years or something with the pandemic in there. And when I was a white belt, everyone's like, dude, when you get to blue belt, people are going to quit. And I'm like, why would people quit? I'm like, these are all my homies. Everyone's working so hard. We're showing up all the time. Pandemic hit and like ev- so many people that I knew quit. And then I kept going and like I got to a new school down here in San Diego. And it's just wild how how many people really do. It's not like it, it feels like a thing. Like when you start people are like, oh, blue belt blues or when you get to blue, everyone quits. But it's really true. I mean, people hit that. They can't. It's almost like they can't get past the fact that their motivation was this belt system. And that's all it was. And they didn't attach to anything else. And they didn't fall in love with the art of it. And so they got stuck on this. Here's your stripe. Here's your stripe. Here's your stripe. And they go, now you're not really going to get anything for like two years. And people, they lose hope and they step out. It sucks, bro. How is your jujitsu training? I'm not doing it as much, man. Uh, I'm slagging off. I, I, I'm a big I'm a big jujitsu advocate. Uh, I'll go to the gym and I'll watch, but it requires like a lot. Like it pretty much has to be a private, bro. I have to pretty yeah. much have like a one on one session with somebody. Uh, sometimes like I'll need help moving my leg for me. But like I'll give you an example. The other day I was I was hanging out with my boy and um, actually we were with Roberto Jimenez. We did like a little a little podcast with him and um, one of our friends. We were there and, and like I started grappling with him and like he turned his back and like I took his back and I choked him and yeah. and like I, I, I like pushed myself around his guard and like I brought my knee over and I mounted and it, it's cool. It's fun. But yeah. frankly, bro, it's the passion of doing it just isn't the same anymore because I loved jujitsu because I loved I love to do flashy things. I love to I love to beat people up. I, I love the competitive nature. You know what I mean? I, yes, I love to compete. Um, and I find that it's hard to do that now because yeah. if I train with my able-bodied friends, 
they're taking it easy and they're letting me, you know? And then, I mean, I have one friend. He used to be a wrestler. He's a paraplegic. He's, he's not a quadriplegic. So, like, he has perfect use of his hands. Mm -hmm. And we've trained a couple of times. And it's a good time because it's a good scrap. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not, I'm not training as much as I, as I should. With that, this, um, I, I had the blind grappler on, and we talked a lot about, uh, like, able-bodied competition and, and training jujitsu jitsu after, uh, you know, injury and the community that he's kind of become in touch with as a result of uh, being blind and then finding that within the community. And I wonder, like, how has your perception changed around uh, able-bodied sports uh, accessibility just in general, like in the world when you're, when you're traveling around and like, uh, you know, now you have a, a wheelchair when you're moving around, how is your vision, like your perception of just being in the world adjusted I mean, now I'm being on the other side height, of bro. I used to be six one. Now I'm like three foot tall. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but really just about that, like the whole perspective, I was six foot, bro. I, I looked I, not in like an inferior way, but I used to look down on everybody. I was taller than most people, you know? Now I'm like at crotch height. It's, it's kind of funny. <laughs> shoot the just shoot double legs all day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but but um, you know, I think I'm really lucky that we live in the U.S. or I live in the yeah. U.S. and the U.S. is pretty ADA for the most part. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I I definitely feel like like if I lived in a third world country, my life would be a lot harder. Right. A hundred percent. Yeah, it it's as much as there's a lot to improve upon there's definitely quite a good system in place to, yeah, man, like, you know, like, pretty decent effort. Exactly. Like I, I wake up, I go, I, I get dressed. I can drive my car wherever I want to go. You know, I can, I can go to the hospital if I want to do therapy. I can go to the gym if I want to do the gym. I can go to my friend's house. Like when I have to do stuff for work, you know, like yeah. it, in, in other countries, you can't do that. I'm actually going back home to Paraguay um, for 10 days next month in November. And I'm excited to see, what it's going to be like because that country yeah. is not ada you know what i mean no it'll, de it'll definitely be and it, it's interesting <laughs> hearing you i just kind of think about out loud now and, and hearing you talk about this in a way for someone who likes challenges and like pushing themselves there's kind of a whole new basket of challenges that you get to experience i, I know that's kind of a weird way of looking at it but you know like going to Paraguay for you is going to be adventurous to yeah. some degree because yeah, you're going to get to go and you're going to get to like solve this puzzle of how to move around and interact and like experience a place that you know you've been before and you've you've experienced in a different fashion and now you get to do it this way so it's it's like that that mindset that mindset shift that you made that day in the hospital it's so crucial because it shapes how you interact with everything else after that you know you really could have shot yourself in the foot there that day and become completely downtrodden and depressed and overwhelmed. And you chose, which is crazy, to just not let that happen. Yeah, bro. Life's about choices, dude. Every day we wake up and we, we choose who we want to be because we act. And your actions are either going to take you that way or that way. Where do you want to go? You know, I want to go that way. So I'm going to make all my <laughs> actions take me that way. What was it like when you started to do the, you do hand controls for driving? Yeah, yeah, I do hand controls. How, so how do you go, when you're, uh, when you're getting your license or updating your license, how does that whole process go? Uh, so you go to like uh, a hospital and there's like a car there that's special hand controls. And it was actually funny, bro. When I first started, I wasn't strong enough to turn the car steering wheel. Wow. Yeah. I remember, I remember, um, I, I kept, it's a, going. it's a stationary car. It's like a no, simulator. No, they, they had me like driving around the parking line. I would have oh, to gotcha. pull up the accelerator to like try to turn it with both arms. And sometimes like the, the lady would have to help me. So I remember the first day, like I couldn't do a full turn. Yeah. And so I left and I had my, my caretaker at the time drive me straight to the gym and I just killed chest flies for like 30 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> yes. you're the man you're the man that's the coolest <laughs> so you just went and got super strong yeah yeah pretty much and then and then honestly after like three times i had it i had i mean i wasn't confident but i had it down and then i i, uh, I went to the dmv i used like yeah. the hospitals then i got approved by the license and then i just um 
I, I took my car to the shop and I showed them like the certificate, the prescription to modify my car and then they did it for me. And since then I've been independent with that. So, so then your your accelerator and your braking are both performed by paddles or they're performed by by gears? Uh there's like so it's if there's a little tri pin that I like just put my hand in and it allows me to turn. And then yep. here I have um like a lever. If I push forward it's a brake. And if I push down I accelerate and then there's a little button that I can touch the horn with. How like how valuable is mobi I mean mobility is like a huge thing. You know, something that I think a lot of us, myself included, you just kinda take for granted. You know, like I can go downstairs and get my truck, drive to training. It's it's so second nature that sometimes I'm halfway to training and I'm like, Oh oh my god, I'm driving to train <laughs> you know, like it's so you do it so much and you've been doing it since you're sixteen, it got my license. That's a huge part of life is your Thanks, ability bro. to go where you want when you want to go there, <laughs> not when someone else can come and make it happen. So what was the timeline from incident to when like you regained that full freedom for yourself? Uh, you know, it's kind of funny that you mention it, bro, because I always say this, like I went from being an adult to pretty much being a baby again, to having to learn to be an adult all over. Like I, I needed help with literally everything. And bro, being able to drive was a game changer because before I could drive, I literally had to have someone with me pretty much 24 seven. Cause if I needed to go yeah. somewhere, like I needed to be driven. Bro, you know how annoying it is to have somebody with you 24 oh, I can only ima I can only imagine, dude. Yeah. I can only imagine. I actually can't yeah. even imagine. Like I can say that I can imagine, but I, I, you're right. It's a complete like theoretical regression down to this other stage of life. You know, the one that it's kind of funny actually how life works because you start as an infant and then like, you know, when you're 85, 90, you're kind of an infant again. Yeah. Like you yeah. have to have that same care that you had in the beginning that you did. <laughs> it's like this big arc in life. Uh, wait, so you come out of it, you're, you're basically with a, a caretaker 24 seven. Yeah. Well, at first it was my mom and uh, that was really heavy on our relationship because yeah. I didn't fight with my mom before, but then being with her 24 seven, bro, we were fighting a lot. Yeah. And so then, um, I hired a very good friend of mine to come take care of me. And then that slowly transitioned into her becoming my girlfriend. We're no longer together, but that was also toxic because bro, imagine having your girlfriend having to do everything for you. Nah, that's even I'm not more. signing up for that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I didn't know what I myself into beautiful, like great woman, but it was yeah. just it, that, that dynamic wasn't working. Um, and so now I have a guy, he comes in the morning, he helps me with like basic things and then he leaves and I do my own thing and that that's working out really great. So what was your, like, what's the vibe in the car? I feel like that's gotta be just the best, like go wherever the hell you want, play the music you want to do. Like, do you just, I would just drive to drive. I feel like that would be so fun. <laughs> I do that sometimes, bro. I do that sometimes. So how, how far is the gym from your spot? Cause you're training a lot, right? You said you're basically training every day. Yeah, yeah. So I work out at a gym. It's like down the road, maybe eight minutes away. Um, and do you train with someone there? Yeah, I have a couple of friends that yeah. are pro bodybuilders. And yeah. they just kind of, for whatever reason, they just love me. And they're like, yo, bam, let's go train, you know, hit me up, yeah. let's go, whatever. And so I try to schedule with them. And then sometimes if, if they can't go, I'll go by myself or I'll even, I'll hit up whatever. I'll hit up any friend. I'll be like, yo, let's hit the gym, you know. And So um, how do Go but, go ahead go ahead go ahead. No, that's it. They just they help me with like I have I think I think I'm getting to the question you were gonna ask. How do I work out? Right? How does it work? Yeah, like what are what are the exercise? How do you how do you do it? Yeah, physically the exercises stuff like that. I was gonna ask about something else, but I'll I'll save it to the end too. But Got go ahead. Yeah. Um. So yeah, man, I have these these this bag of like little gadgets called Active Hands. Uh huh. And some of them are like hooks. Some of them it has like a ring that I attach to my to my wrist and so I can attach the cable to it so I can like push off of there. And you can, so you can do like a pull or a press <laughs> or overhead and exactly. it hooks on right by your wrist. Exactly. Another one I have, it's like, it wraps around the dumbbell so I can like grab the dumbbell and like do weights and it's just yep. like tied to my hand. Um, but go ahead, ask whatever question you have. I was going to ask you what, um, you're hanging out with a bunch of bodybuilders. I mean, what is like the supplement regimen like? And then are there things that you take for, the injury and are there any like conflictions there as far as bodybuilding lifting goes and what you're taking as far as nutrition so they, they gave me a bunch of pills to take when i was in the hospital and i took them for the first year or so but i weaned myself off of them because i did not like them like for yeah. example 
if you don't move your legs enough, <coughs> you actually, your legs start spazzing out. And so, uh, like, if I don't, let's say I'm sitting around all day, my legs will, like, kick. And so they give you so these, like, muscle relaxers. And if you take these muscle relaxers, your legs don't kink, but then you're lethargic. Yeah, yeah. Tired. Um, bunch of stuff. So what I did was I just decided I'm going to wean on myself off of these pills and I'm just going to move my body and try to be as healthy as possible. And honestly, bro, it's probably one of the best decisions I made. Dude, I think that's so <laughs> whack. Like, so I've had, uh, when I was 16, I had cardiothoracic chest surgery. So it's like a huge scar. They they pulled me open and they cut cartilage off my ribs and then they stitched a metal rod back in there, sewed me up, and then they took that out six weeks later. Wow. And when I was in the, I mean, pretty like, pretty excruciating pain. It was eight hours of surgery, three days in a hospital. I lost like a ton of weight. I was immobilized like right around my chest. And dude, they, they tried to give me everything like Percocet, Vicodin, Dilaudin to combat the nausea from the Percocet. And like, it just got to this point where I was like, I'm done. I'm just, I don't care. I was like, I'll just, I'll just feel the pain. At least I'll know like what hurts, what doesn't, right? Sleeping was pretty bad, but I knew, I knew if I like bumped into something, it was painful right away. So I had to be like extra cautious about where I went, but I just kept thinking about, I'm like, man, it's so wild that they will just prescribe you this insane amount of stuff to mitigate the pain and then kind of like send you on your way and be like, Hey Ben, good luck. You know, if you need more, call us. And you're like, wait, but this is fucking me up. Like I can't even, I'm they don't have leg spasms, but now I'm completely nauseous. want to throw up all the time. And like, I feel broken. And that that's just the track that they expect <laughs> you to stay on as you're like getting better. It just, it, it's crazy to me, bro. There's actually, I'm like, I'm so glad you said that. Cause I had such a similar situation. I was in the ICU and I was in pain and they gave me oxycodone. And like, I here's pill. heroin. Yeah, 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 bro, bro. I take one pill. Yeah. And bro, I went from being in a lot of pain to like, life is amazing, you know? But then the issue is, as soon as that effect wears off, bro, you have, and it was one pill, bro. It's not like I was yeah. doing a bunch. I took one pill. I had my head hurt. My body was like withdrawn. My body was asking for more. And so a couple hours go by and, and the lady comes. She's like, oh, do you need another dose? And I was like, yeah, I feel terrible. Give me yeah. another dose. She gives me another Oxycontin. And bro, after when the effect wore off, it was even worse. Like I was feeling yeah. worse. I was feeling my body, my brain was hurting, man. I don't know if you've ever had that feeling, but it's yeah. The, like, yeah. I would, I, I told the lady, I was like, man, please never give me that again. I would rather feel the pain than have to deal with this. And honestly, bro, it gives me so much more respect for people who like were addicted to drugs and had to like are now sober for like 20 years or whatever because if after two pills it was so hard for like my body kept asking for more i can't imagine what it's like if if you're really addicted that's that must be well and and you're like we've already established very clearly that you're like a mentally really strong person right so you had the ability in that moment to be like you know what i'm going to take the pain which is insane most people won't do that and forego the medicine and then and keep on this track. Now let's just you're, assume you're a somewhat mentally weak-minded person and they give you that. And you go from feeling pain to feeling euphoria. And then when the euphoria goes away, they go, do you want more euphoria or do you want pain? 95% of people probably, they go, oh, just give me more of the, the medication. And then now you're on that track. You're on that hamster wheel and it's going to just keep spinning. And then, yeah, you, you how many people have you met, especially in in the jujitsu world who have like gotten sober and they found jujitsu and it's been the thing that like keeps them on track. So many people. I was literally just talking to someone uh, the other day who is formerly a heroin addict, sober for 17 years and jujitsu has played this like big role in that because it gave them this physical outlet. And I'm like, man, the strength of these people mentally to overcome not just overcome addiction, like the, the physiological effects of addiction, but to leave friend groups that are fully like built around addiction yeah. to say no more to like relationships, people you think you care about, you rebuild social <laughs> settings, give up parts of your life and then find something else. It just like my hat's off to them on, on so many levels. It's really inspiring. It's super cool, man, honestly.
I uh, I have a friend. I have a friend, Nick Santonastaso. I don't know if you've heard of him. Nope. He's a motivational speaker. He was he was born with like a deficiency, and now he just has like one arm and like one. Wait. Arm. I do know this guy. Okay, cool. He's so, like kind of a pretty big deal, right? Yeah, yeah. He's a huge deal. He's. I've seen this guy. Yeah, yeah. So I went to his office a couple months ago. He was having like a boot camp for like public yep. speaking. And um, one of his like prodigies, pretty much one of the guys that he trains, he has been sober. He used to be a heroin addict and he has been sober for 20 something years. And bro, wow. how sharp that guy was, how on point he was, I was I was nothing but impressed. There's another guy who actually has my same last name, I think, Maynard. Uh, do you know who that is? No. Something Maynard. I think he's he's a motivational speaker, but also a quadriplegic. It, it, oh, it's incredible. Like, do you have any aspirations to get into public speaking, motivational speaking, like that track of of work and and giving back? Yeah, man. I, I actually I was lucky enough to speak at the Blue Collar American Dream Conference last year. It was my first time wow. speaking on a big stage. Yeah, and um, I was really happy with the results that the crowd got, bro, because. I just went up there casual. Honestly, I didn't really plan that much. And the crowd loved it, bro. At one point, even, I remember I, I got, I was a little nervous. And I was like, honestly, guys, I'm a little nervous. And, bro, the crowd was like, no, you're killing it. Keep going, you know. Keep telling the story. And um, it was it was a really good feeling. Not only that, but because I know that my story impacts others in a positive way. And so it's nice to, like, be able to receive, but also to give at the same time. Because if you just receive, 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 and you're not giving back, there's something wrong, right? So we, we've talked a lot about the inspiration that you provide, the, the positives, the perseverance, the, the good stuff. Right? <clears throat> yeah. What are, what's the other side like? What is the, the mental battle of, of the dips of when you're feeling down, when you're realizing the things that you love to do that you don't anymore? Like, how, how do you get through those days? What keeps you on track and and keeps you in the like in the right headspace well uh, what's pretty cool is like as time goes by i have those days like i haven't had one of those days in a while mm -hmm. at first i had those days a lot because yeah. i would like sit on my phone and just scroll through my old pictures of me being jacked and like yeah like competing <laughs> and like jumping around and you know yeah. just killing it <clears throat> and um that made me sad, bro. It made me sad. It made yeah. me feel like I was missing out. Um, it honestly sucked. But you have to just accept your reality and and just move forward, bro. And once once I was able to fully do that and really accept where I'm at, and that kind of goes hand in hand back with that question that you had about hope earlier. Yeah. Where you asked me like, why well, I, I had hope and I kept getting disappointed because I hoped to be like I used to be and it wasn't happening. And so once I was able to just kind of accept my reality and just put my best foot forward, it um, it allowed me to not have to deal with that pain anymore. Acceptance is hard, man. It's really yeah. hard. It's hard for, you know, any, I mean, any situation going on in the world, any situation in your family, <coughs> things in your own life. I, I think acceptance is hard because it requires honesty. And acceptance is really just with you, right? It's not you I, I can't accept your reality for you you have to do it and when you have to do it you got to look in the mirror and that's a hard fucking thing for people to do yeah 110 percent. it's it's you versus you man every day you know and and you gotta compare yourself to who like it's tough right because like you don't want to like in a situation like mine right like from one day to another like i don't want to compare myself to how i was two years ago because right I was, you know, way, physically at least way better off, but mentally worse. So even yeah. then, I do want to compare myself because if I look back, actually, now that I think about it, like, mentally I was worse off, even though I was okay, but I was worse off than I am now. And physically I was better. And now I may be physically limited, but, um, I mean, I just feel so much better. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Well, I really, I like what you said about effort. I <laughs> this, there was a point I was trying to make, and I got lost in my own train of thought, and so I totally messed it up. I realized, but because uh, I was talking about this with someone at jujitsu about effort and like that feeling of when someone gives up, right? When they, uh, you feel them kind of break. But effort is really the only thing that matters. And, and when you're looking at, uh, 
you know, let's say you're in an academy and you're watching people roll. There's going to be people that are just less skilled than others. It's just there's people that are less athletic than others. But what you look for in a practitioner, and I think this is the same thing you look for in a in a career or in a teammate. You look for someone who who truly gave it the best shot that they possibly could have. And maybe that best shot is being on bottom and just getting smashed. And their you know, their ears getting ground into the side and someone's knees on their neck and they're like, Man, I just can't escape this position. But you see them trying. You see them really trying to get out of it. Because you know that person's unbreakable and they will if they just keep going, they will continue in every aspect of their life to move forward and to level up. And the other people that are relying on just how they are and not really tapping into this will and this effort, they are going to be the ones that break, the ones that cannot handle in t- tough situations. Like to some degree, Ben, you were built for this. Yeah, literally. You know, like you, your mindset, your fortitude, your effort, your style – Everything about it uh, was set up for you to thrive in this kind of adversity and to have a message that fucking connects with hundreds of thousands of people around the world. Like, that's really, really cool, man. It's kind of funny, bro. Like, when, when I first got hurt, I had a lot of friends come up to me and were like, like, if it happened to anybody, I'm glad it happened to you. And I was like, what the fuck does that mean, bro? And they were like, bro, you're one of the few people that has, like, the mental strength to actually handle this. Yeah, a lot of people don't. Yeah, but I you can you can turn around. I disagree with that. I think everybody has the mental strength to do it. I think it's just a matter of like when you can realize it. So on on this, I'm glad that you said (coughs) that. Um, I'm really glad that you said that because I want to know what do you say to someone who is dealing with any kind of adversity similar to yours, truly like life changing experience, things that are changing the actual available paths for them to go forward what do you tell them assuming that their mindset may fall anywhere on that spectrum of belief um well i'll give you an example and give me a second okay well i'll give you an example man like i have a i there's there's a program that i do it it's almost like a mentorship program not really but whenever there's like a new quadriplegic in the office I mean, in the, in the hospital, like, I'll reach out and I'll be like, hey, man, like, let me go visit them to the therapist and I'll pull up on them and, and I'll tell them my story pretty much. I'll be like, look, bro, like, I was exactly where you were and I know it feels like your life is over, but it's not, bro. You just have to adapt. You just have to find your way around it. Um, and that's all it is about, man. It's just adapt, adapting to be able to, to like, reintegrate yourself back into society. Yeah. I mean, at, at the end of the day, like, Bro, if you just sit around all day, like there, there's a phase. There's a phase where you sit around. I call it the boomy phase. Where you're like, boomy? oh, boomy, yeah, boomy. Oh, it's, boom, it's, oh, <laughs> like boom, like me, shame on me, yeah, 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 yeah like boomy, my life sucks. Oh my god, I'm a quadriplegic. Uh, but like that's you can't stay in there forever because if you stay in there forever, bro, you're like your life's gonna suck. You know? Yeah. You have to make life good, bro. You have to enjoy it, and so yeah, feel the pain, go through it, bro. Go through the emotions, but don't hold on to them, like. You are not what is happening to you. You are simply uh, seeing those things happen. Feel your emotions, process them, release them, and, and keep going. Damn, Ben. Yeah, I mean, you're. I hope. I hope it's as contagious with the listeners as it is with me. But just your <laughs> your mindset and your. It's. Not, I don't want to call it optimism because sometimes I feel like optimism can be taken as like like a false sense of of security or a false sense where it doesn't seem as genuine but it really does seem that way i mean it seems like you've not only have you had time to think about this and like really harden into your your perspective here but it's it's like applicable right because even like someone like myself listening to this i might not apply to your exact situation but i can take the words that you're saying and internalize them and think of different areas in my life where they apply and i think that's one thing just from my perspective that makes your messaging really special in the social sphere is that yes, you are saying it from this place, but these are lessons that can kind of hit home for everyone. You know, you don't, you could not have had a life altering event happen to you and still take something like that into account. 
and not become a you know a, a victim of whatever perceptions you have in your head about your reality and the thing that you said about choices right like you have the power to look at this and decide how you want to adjust and how you want to go forward and it's hard man to hearing it's one thing but it, but putting that into action is another it's it's tough to do that on any level well like like bro like okay like being like quadriplegia like the accident is like the worst thing that ever happened to me the hardest thing i ever had to go through but like the, like it's uh the worst thing that happened to me hurt me the same way that the worst thing that happened to you hurt you what why do babies cry when they are born do you know why babies cry i mean i'm not sure i don't know if this is science but like i heard this yeah. once and it makes sense why do babies cry i i would imagine just thinking on the spot that they're crying because of like discomfort or unknown environment like they haven't solved the world yet so they don't really know what their immediate they just don't know what what's going on <laughs> Exactly. Like, yeah. that is the worst thing that they have ever been through. But what happens, bro? <laughs> Existing. What, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, it's, but what happens? Like, a little bit of time goes by and they stop crying. They get over it. They realize that it's not that bad. Yeah. That's what happens with 99% of the problems that people have. They go away. They go away, bro. Or you learn to deal with them. You go around it. The obstacle in the way is the way. Like, if I have to go from point A to point C and B is in the way... I, I can't like AC doesn't make sense. It's ABC. I have to go through B. The obstacle in the way is the way. I have to just follow the way. Yeah, it's a lot harder. A lot harder, unfortunately, in reality to to put that in play and to not get caught up on the on the what ifs and the the sensation that you're missing out. Are is there ever so? I I'm a big fan of of your social presence. Right. I think that everything you're putting out is great with your reach and your then the expansion and like the more people that you get in contact with the more people that reach out and talk to you and, and you're able to share your story with are there people that try to pull you down or is there any side of this where it's like you experience negativity or people like like cutting you down saying that uh your injury is fake like any kind of shit like that yeah 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 one time i had a i had somebody tell me that i didn't need the surgery because they googled what a what a C five C six fusion was, and they saw that like some people have hernias and it's optional, and so one time I had like a crazy lady DM me saying like, oh, this is bullshit. Your your like your injury is fake, and I was like, yo, like I honestly hope that your life gets better because if your life sucks <laughs> so much that you're over here trying to bring me down because I'm oh, a quadriplegic, God. like yeah. like I hope that your life gets better, and she was like, stay in your fucking wheelchair lane, you little bitch, whatever, and I was like, all right, man, like. I'm just gonna Dude, block you. What? Yeah, this feels crazy. I blocked it. I don't even know her name. I just can't. <laughs> I I don't understand. Um, I mean, here here I am giving airtime to like these people, right? But I I don't I don't get that. I just don't understand. Bro, they're miserable. How... They're miserable. They hate their lives so much, and that they yeah. see somebody doing well and thriving, and they're jealous because they're like, why is this guy doing so well if he's in a situation and I'm not? But yeah. that's like the worst possible mindset that you can have, bro. Like, yeah. um, envy and jealousy are the worst characteristics. Like, bro, I see my friends doing well, and I want them to do better. You know, I'm like, fuck yeah, yeah bro, keep killing it. And then there's other people who, for whatever reason, their minds don't work with that, and they see somebody doing well, and they're envious, and they wish they were doing that well, and they try to bring them down. And I hope their lives get better, bro. Yeah. The. Uh when I was, so the, when the blind grappler was on here, he, he has a, like a system on his phone where he can, if he, if it's really, really close to his face, like, like really close, he can discern some of what is being said. And cool. so then he'll use voice activation to respond. Right. So if you send me a message, maybe he, that, or with the help of his daughter, he deciphers what it is. And then he uses voice text to respond back. So it comes in a big text thread. And he was telling me that people would, they're like, you're not really uh, impaired because you obviously read texts all day and you never get off social media and all you do is type, 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 type. And I'm like, dude. And and I, I think you're right. It's because here's a guy who, despite something, <coughs> is showing up. He's learning how to compete in jujitsu without that sight of his eyes, right? It's It's challenging how people feel they would react in a situation they're seeing you excel you take it in stride you 
take the the higher road on yourself and then inspire other people and they're going that can't be real there's no way that someone on earth is that you know focus and honed in on on positivity and so they try and rip you down and it's insane i cannot believe that people sit home like that behind their keyboards behind their phones and they just fucking chirp at people who are like going through some of the most difficult things but the the good news is that that those people are a very small like quantity yeah. of people like like percentage wise it's maybe like 0.05% you know what i mean like yeah like it's it's a very small little angry group of people <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's something that you know. It just in the way that you responded, obviously, it's of nothing, right? It's it's insignificant. It's it's not something that well that you think. I'll be real with you, bro. Like it, it cooks in the back of your head. Like if if you read it, like and like for a day or two, I was a little pissed, man. Like frankly, for a day or two, I was like, man, like what what did I do to them? You know, yeah. but, uh, you get over it. Like they they're irrelevant. Yeah, it's. Staying in your lane and staying focused is one of the uh, the things with social media is, you know, you open yourself up to it and you invite it because you're there and it's it, your message is growing and the people that you're inspiring are growing. And so there's always going to be those people. And the more people that you impact, the bigger that number is going to be forever. Yeah. Right. It just grows in correlation to the other. And so you're right. Yeah. It's kind of like you just got to let it go. But haters going to hate, bro. You know, like there's no better way to say it. So what's on what's on your horizon for these goals around your fitness regimen? You're getting into bodybuilding. Is there any like do you think you would ever do anything on that side of competition, like in the fitness world out, outside of rugby? Um, well that would that would be interesting, man. I, I, I haven't really right now, I told my, my friend who's a pro bodybuilder, I was like, Bro, right now my goal is just to be the strongest quadriplegic in the world. I just wanna be a fucking monster. Um, <laughs> yeah, <I do>. yes. <laughs> and so what is the, what is uh what does progress feel like for when you're doing like your strength and conditioning exercise when you're doing bodybuilding and you're on these splits how does your body recover and then do you feel like do you notice or maybe you're measuring this but like do you can you see increases in mass is that correlated at all to your diet are you paying attention to nutrition and food intake now that you're lifting this way like how does that progress get measured for you um no no i'm not doing like i I don't pay attention but like i just eat as much as i can um as often as i can like yet last night i had a bunch of like a pound of steak and i was so hungry so i had half a pizza (laughs) (laughs) that's like some darth rigatoni uh meals there yeah yeah um but it's cool man like it's cool and honestly like with the bodybuilding i'm seeing results uh like Literally every week, my numbers are going up, yeah. which is surprising. Uh, like before, I if you put like a, a weight on my arm and you had me extend my arm, I yeah. couldn't even move five pounds. Yeah. Uh, like like I couldn't extend my arm before. Honestly, I couldn't even do this. You know, um, within a matter of, of of two weeks, I I'm pushing like seven and a half pounds on each side. Hell yeah! You know? Yeah, yeah, and it's just and I see the the muscle growing and. It feels great, bro. It's honestly it, an amazing feeling. Like I look in the mirror and I look better every time, and I'm just like, "Fuck yeah!" It looks it's great. really cool to see how this, like, I mean, the <laughs> the old adage, you know, if you don't you if you don't use it, you lose it. But it it's kind of cool to see that, like, you're forcing yourself to use your body to do things that otherwise seem difficult. Even pushing, pulling, pressing, lifting, doing all these things. That's tough. It's it's hard at baseline, let alone as a paraplegic, right? And doing it, you're seeing your body start to go, oh, okay, well, yeah, we'll do this, right? Like, hey, we're going to start doing press. Oh, we can't do that now. Well, now we can. Now it's five pounds. Now it's seven and a half pounds. So you're kind of, you're disproving this like limitation in real time. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was actually, I, I was really excited the other day because, I'm at the gym and I, I had um I was with my caretaker, yep. and I asked him to pull the cable and hook it onto my wrist so that I could do my rows, and he was struggling so much to pull the cable over because he was like it's too heavy, and I was yeah. like come on bro I'm a quadriplegic man like what are you talking about you better start hitting the gym man I started bullying him you know <laughs> yeah. yeah I liked your uh, you you had a good like call out the other day where you're just kind of <laughs> like you're like hey you got to roast your friends if they're not putting in the work and it, it's like. 
I I enjoy how you accept and use humor too. You know, humor is so important, man. Like you got to be able to laugh at your friends. You definitely got to be able to laugh at yourself. If you're taking 100%. yourself too seriously, you, your yeah. life's gonna suck. <laughs> and so that video, I was cracking up because I'm like, I know, I know his buddies are like seeing this and they're like, shit, man, I, I do, I gotta get in there. I gotta like Ben's holding me accountable by uh, roasting me. It's awesome. It was cool. It was cool. And then I liked my friends calling each other out too. I got a kick out of it. Yeah. <laughs> well, Ben, it's uh, it's been incredible having you on. I, I, I think I've said this a million times now, but like your your mindset, it really is contagious and inspirational. And, and I really don't mean that in like a foo fooey just kind of blanket statement. I mean, you're taking something that would just absolutely crush the majority of people that dealt with it and did a full 180 on it. And you are showing that you can do things you put your mind to. You can operate within any limitation and still find ways to be inspiring and ways to level up. And you're continually adding. I mean, literally each time I watch something, it's like you've added a new thing in your life that you weren't able to do before. And like, I just, I, I really hope from the bottom of my heart that your message reaches like millions of people and that Thank they you. can be inspired and, and follow along with this because you're showing that it's possible, really possible to have a positive mindset through the worst experience. Thank you. Amen. It's, it's been great being on here. It's great to actually get to know you and talk to you more, bro. And, and I agree, man. I, I hope more people can, can I, I hope I can help continue to help spread the light. And we will, uh, we'll put the link in the show notes again, if people miss that in the beginning, so you can check out Ben's foundation, get involved, donate, follow along. Uh, so check the show notes for the link there. Ben, yeah. thank you. We'll definitely do this again in the future, brother. Awesome, man. Thank you, brother. All right, now hang